I want you to turn this morning, we're going back to two verses that we touched on last Sunday morning. We're in the book of Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. And we're going to read two verses, verses 18 and 19. We just touched on these. We didn't elaborate. We didn't preach on them last Sunday morning. Uh, we were thinking, remember, last Sunday, just to refresh your memory, it was Pentecost Sunday. And we were thinking about how the Holy Spirit came to, to empower the church on that first day of Pentecost, as we call it. And then we touched on these two verses. And I felt it would be good just to come back to this today. Uh, and I'm going to really just move on. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at something today, and then I'm going to look at something over a couple of weeks in connection with this, uh, God willing, next Sunday and the Sunday after. But it's Isaiah chapter 43, and it's verse 18. The Lord says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now, as I've said, we, we mentioned these two verses last Sunday. You may remember last Sunday I said how, you know, on the day of Pentecost, it says, suddenly there came the sounds of a rushing mighty wind. We, we also thought at the tail end of the message last Sunday morning about how quickly God can move whenever God decides it's time to move. Remember I mentioned King Saul. A normal day in his life, his father sent him out to look for donkeys that had got lost or for mules. Call them whatever you will. And uh, before that day came to a close, he had an audience with, uh, with the prophet Samuel. And his life was never, ever going to be the same after that. Moses was the same at the burning bush, looking after the sheep, doing what he had done every single day. But there was something different. And on that particular day, Moses' life took a change, a change of direction, a change of meaning, a change of purpose. Everything in his experience changed in the moment of time. And in these verses here, the Lord says in verse 19, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Friends, today I want very quickly, very uh, very briefly, because obviously you, you don't cover this in one message, but I, I'm trying just to put stuff together very quickly today uh, for you in one message. I want to speak today about preparing for the new. Preparing for the new. Behold, I do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. How do we prepare for what's going to be new? How do we prepare for what God wants to do in these days of time that will be fresh, that will be alive, that will be vibrant, that will be completely in the hand of God? How do we prepare for the new? Whenever we mention new, can I say this morning that for most of us, for all of us, something new can be completely different for every one of our lives. You see, every single one of us, we have different personalities. We have, have different needs in our lives. And each one of us, whenever we think about something new in our experience, no doubt there's a variety of things that would be thought about across the congregation today. All of different needs, different experiences in life. You know, it may be today you could be here perhaps, maybe you want a victory in some particular area of your life. A victory in some particular aspect of your Christian experience. Or for someone else, for something new for you, perhaps you might want to get into a new dimension with the Lord in the place of prayer. Alistair mentioned prayer this morning. Maybe that would be something new in your experience. Someone else perhaps, you just might want a, a greater or they might want a, a deeper understanding of the ways of God. And for you, maybe that's the new thing that you would be thinking about or desiring. Someone else perhaps might want to see a, a breakthrough in their family, whether it be by way of salvation or whatever. There's, there's all kinds of needs. There are all kinds of experiences. There are all kinds of new things that we all individually need. But I want you to notice in these verses, whenever you're preparing for the new, before God speaks about doing something new, in verse 18 of the two verses, God says there's something that we need to forget about. He says, remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. 
God is saying, don't think about the past. Instead, look at, focus upon the new thing that I'm going to do, the new thing that I want to do. The past is over. The book is closed upon the past. And we need to understand that God is far, far more interested, friends, in our future than anything that's in our past. And our past can be full of all kinds of things. Failure, disappointment. We'll look at some of these things in just a moment or two. But God is interested in our future. Some people think that God is, as it were, stuck in the past. And so there's a way it has to be done. There's a way it has always been done. And that's where God is at. That's where you find God at. And some other people think that all God ever wants to do is to remind us of all of the things that we have failed in or all of the things perhaps that we have done wrong. But the truth is, God is more interested in our future. Do you believe that? See, I believe that today with all of my heart. Because listen to me. The future is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. We will not be in the past again. Yesterday is gone. But tomorrow in his will, if he spares us, if he tarries, the next day, next week, next month. Friends, the future is where life is at for you and for me. And God is interested in the future of our lives. He says, forget about the past. Remember not the former things. Don't think about them. Don't consider them. Look at the new thing that I am going to do. Now let's get this into context for just a moment. Because in this section of the book of Isaiah, Israel was being judged. The judgment of God was upon the nation because of their sin and because of their rebellion against the Lord. And yet even in the midst of that, God comes to them. God wants to give them hope. He wants to give them encouragement. He wants to, to bless his people, even in the midst of the judgment that he has pronounced upon them as a nation that has gone away from God. He wanted the people to know. He needed them to know that even though they were being judged, yet, praise God, they were not being forsaken. And friends, that's who God is today. He's a faithful one, bless his holy name. The judgment would not be the end of them. In fact, God wanted to give them a, a, a fresh start. God wanted to give them a, a, a new beginning. You know, and Israel, no doubt, was, was discouraged because of what was happening to them, because they maybe even thought this was going to be the end of them. They had gone so far. They had sinned. They had rebelled against God. Maybe they thought God would never again move amongst them or move in the nation. But God would just simply cast them off. And you see, with thinking like that, whenever you feel like that, that causes you to look backwards instead of forwards. If you look at the future and you feel there's no definite hope in the future, or like Israel in their situation, under the judgment of God, whether they recognized it and realized it or not, things weren't as they should be, Things weren't going as well as they should have been going. And whenever you hit that kind of situation, instead of looking forward, you're always inclined to look back. And they began, no doubt, to remember the former things. They began to think about the past deliverances. They began to think about the past victories. And so they could remember the former things but they could not see the potential of what lay before them in their future. And that's why in this verse, God comes to them and he says, look, don't remember the former things. You see, I'm not saying today that we shouldn't think about experiences we've already had. You know, it's good to encourage ourselves in the Lord. It's good to be able to look back and, and say, God did this, God was there, God broke through in that situation. It's good to be able to do that. But whenever you've gone to the stage where things are not going as they should go, and whenever you can't see a hope in the future, you're inclined to look back and you want to linger where those experiences were. You want to linger where you experienced those blessings that were in the past. And so God says to them here, no, don't do that. Don't linger in the past. 
Behold, he says, I do a new thing. Remember not the former things. I want to just ask this morning or suggest, maybe that's where you are today. In your own individual experience. Maybe what I'm saying today strikes a chord in your heart. Maybe in your life, perhaps you have maybe even failed the Lord. You have tried something, you have failed at it, you haven't known the victory in some area or in something that you had hoped that you would have known. And you feel that you have failed God perhaps so many times. And it's hard to see how God could come again. And you wonder, do you have a future even with the Lord? Well, dear one, if I'm speaking to anyone here this morning, the good news is God is saying, I have plans for your life. Praise God for that today. I have plans for your life. I'm about to do something new for you. Because that's what God was saying to these people in this portion of Scripture. Let me just give you one or two things that you need to do to prepare for the new. Regardless of what the past has been, regardless of whether it's been victory or whether perhaps it's been barren or maybe even perhaps whether it has been failure, to prepare for something new, we must first of all stop making excuses. I'm just looking around. You're so quiet today, huh? Stop making excuses. You see, friends, listen. Whenever something's not the way it should be, we all have reasons why. Am I right or wrong? We can all make excuses. We can all say this is not as it should be because. And we can all pull up the reasons to explain why we're at that stage in our own lives individually or, or why something isn't happening the way it's happening. We can all give the reasons. We need to stop making excuses for what has gone wrong. And we need to make, stop making excuses for what hasn't worked out in the past. And listen to me. We need to stop blaming other people. You see, it's so good to blame him. It's so easy to, or sorry, so easy to blame him. So easy to blame her. We need to stop blaming other people. We need to stop seeing ourselves as the victim of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Other people can hurt us. Other people can disappoint us. Other people can harm us. Other people can scar us. But the only person who can ruin your life, get this please, is you yourself. You're the only person who can do that. Nobody can ruin your life without your permission. And the starting point is just to be honest and to accept responsibility for our own part in the problem, if there's a problem there. Proverbs 28 verse 13. He that covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Another translation puts that verse like this. A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Praise God. He's the God of the second chance. Amen. Bless his wonderful and holy name. Praise God. He can give a fresh start. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He can give a fresh start. The starting point is to be honest and to face up to the problems. And if truth be told, most of the problems that you face in your life, most of the failures that you and I face in life are our own faults. The blame lies completely on our own doorstep. Not the devil, not other people. But more often than not, it's our own faults. You see, people do not like to admit, I made a mistake. Isn't that right? People don't like to say, I blew it. The number one reason that we fail in life is because we don't prepare ourselves for the problems that we are going to face in life. The book of Proverbs says, a sensible man watches for problems and prepares to meet them. But the fool never looks ahead and so he suffers the consequences. 
Was it raining whenever Noah began to build the ark? You see, there was a problem that was coming his way. It was going to rain. There was going to be a flood upon the world. It wasn't raining whenever he began to build the ark, but he began to look ahead. He began to prepare for the problem that was going to come. And of course, that came 120 odd years later, and it took him all that length of time to prepare the ark to face that problem. But he had the foresight and he had the wisdom and he was in touch well enough with God to know that the problem lay in the future. And so he began to prepare for it. And the Bible says he prepared an ark uh, to the saving of his soul and that of his, his entire household. Praise God for that today. Sometimes we don't prepare and because we aren't prepared for the problems we feel. Another thing about it is we feel sometimes because we fail to listen to advice whenever advice is given. It tells us in the book of Proverbs chapter 15 that plans fail without good advice. You see, you and I, we need to get all of the advice that we can get. And we need to get that advice from people that we can trust. We need to get that advice from people who know what they're talking about. And we need to get that advice from the Word of God that has been given to build our lives upon and to shape our lives and to help us through life. You see, people don't often listen to advice because they think they don't need advice. Am I right? We call that pride. Pride, you know, ego. There's a good word, E-G-O. Ego stands for edging God out. Just leave God out of it. And whenever a person thinks they know more than God, they push God out of their lives. And they go on an ego trip. And you know where ego trips lead people to? They come to a dead end. Pride, pride it says, goes before a fall. Pride always leads to destruction. And whenever you or whenever I, any of us, think that we know it all, we're setting ourselves up for a fall. We're setting ourselves up completely for failure. So we need to listen. We need to listen to sound advice. We need to prepare for the problems that lie ahead of us. And if we fail to prepare, if we fail to listen, we're heading towards failure. Now, I want to ask you a question today personally. What has God been saying to you? In your own life, in your own walk, in your own experience, what has God been saying to you personally? What preparations do you need to be making? What advice from the Word of God has He been quickening to your heart by His Spirit? Are you obeying what God has been saying to you? What has God been saying to this church? Do we recognize or do we realize what God is saying to this body of believers as a whole? Do we take the time to be before God in prayer, seeking His face that we might know His voice and the leading of His Spirit? amongst us? What has God been saying? You see, these are vital questions because friends, listen to me. If we don't know what God's saying, if you don't know what God is saying to your life privately and personally, then you will have absolutely no idea what God wants you to do in life. You'll have absolutely no idea what God wants you to be about in life. We need to be people who are waiting upon the Lord, listening to his advice, planning for whatever God wants to do and planning for the problems that we're going to face as we seek to do it in his name. Another problem is this. We don't just fail to plan and we don't just fail to listen to advice, but friends, often we stop too soon. Am I speaking to anybody about that this morning? We stop too soon. Proverbs 24, verse 10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength, is small. Someone has said failure is the path of least resistance. And the problem is very often, very often during trying times, we just simply stop trying. Have you ever done that? Does that register with anybody? You know, you get to the stage where you, you nearly throw your hands up and you say, ah, you know, I've had enough of that. Come on, be honest. Have you ever done that? I sometimes preach and I think I'm the only one. 
But we've all done that, haven't we? And you just get so far, and maybe you can't get beyond that barrier, or you can't get over that obstacle, and so you, you, just, you just stop trying. You know the old saying, if at first you don't succeed, well, there's a new slant in that. If at first you don't succeed, welcome to the human race. Because, friends, that's what life is like. If at first you don't succeed, it probably means that you're normal. Amen. I know the Bible says we're abnormal and we're peculiar and all those things, but most of us are just normal people trying to make our way through life looking to the Lord. And he wants to lead us and he wants to guide us. And that means that we will not be successful. We will not be victorious always the first time around. In fact, very, very few people make it, as it were, on the first try. But often we give up whenever success is just around the corner. You know Bill Dunn, Pastor Bill Dunn. You know, Bill always sings, don't give up. You're on the brink of a miracle. And friends, sometimes we stop just short whenever we should just have hung in there a little while longer. See, it's always, someone has said, always too soon to quit we should always keep going on. So we, we need to stop making excuses. We need to admit whenever it's our fault. And we need to get on with life, preparing for the problems, listening to the advice that's around us, listening to what God's saying to us from his word and by his spirit. And we also need to make sure that we have stickability, that we're going to hang in there and keep going. And usually people who are very good at making excuses are rarely good at anything else. You think about that one, because that's truth. That's truth. Now let's move this on for just a moment or two. Another thing that we must do to prepare for the new, we have to take inventory of our own lives. That means to evaluate all of our experiences. You know, what I'm saying is examine your life's experiences and learn from those experiences. Galatians 3, verse 4. Paul asks him, he says, Have you suffered so many things in vain? False teachers had come in. False teachers were trying to tell the church at Galatia that the pure gospel message wasn't enough, that Jesus Christ wasn't enough. They needed rules, they needed regulations, they needed ordinances, they needed all of these other things. And Paul in that epistle, as he defends the gospel, he says to these people, have you suffered so many things in vain? The living Bible says, have you suffered so much for the gospel? Now, are you going to throw it all overboard? You see, we need to learn from past experiences. We need to learn from our mistakes even. And friends, listen to me. Failure can be a friend as well as being a foe. And you get to determine what it's going to be by the way you react to that failure. So many people in Scripture, it was the very failure that they faced that was the thing that pushed them on to achieve the very thing that God called them to do. Amen. And so failure, it depends on how you react or respond to failure. You can choose to learn from it or you can choose to repeat it. In life, there are four kinds of experiences that God uses to shape our lives and to build our lives. There are personal experiences, and that comes from the family that we grew up in and the people that we relate to and the personal experience, you know, husband and wife. And you know the old saying, you know, you can pick your friends, you can't pick your relatives. But that's true. God will use those personal experiences to build something into your life. Another experience that God will use in life is, is vocational and educational experiences. The things that, that your life are about as you grow. Those things will put stuff into your life. Another experience that God uses is spiritual experiences. And that brings us into the whole realm of church and fellowship with one another, and fellowship with the Lord, and the Word of God, and your time that you spend before the Lord, waiting upon Him, with His Word open before you, listening to hear what He has to say, 
spiritual experiences. God will build stuff into your life. And the fourth type of experience is the one that none of us like. And that's the painful experiences of life. God will use those. He will use all of that. Even the painful stuff in life, God will use to develop and to produce character deep down within your being if you respond to that properly. And so as you examine your experiences, you need to ask three things. I've just thrown a lot of stuff out. You can take this home and think about it. But you need to ask yourself three things. What have I learned? That's number one. Number two is, what are my assets? What have I got? And number three is, who? Who can help me? You see, you need people. That's why we have church, fellowship together, others with like mind, others with like ambitions, others in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need one another. And so we need to take inventory of our lives. Next one is this. We need to act in faith if we're preparing for the new. You have to launch out into new territory. The Bible says the key to changing anything, the key to changing anything is faith. Faith. Matthew 9, Jesus says, according to your faith, be it unto you. And you know, that's a very, very simple statement. But friends, that's a very powerful statement because that means that we tend to get out of life what we expect to get out of life. Are you with me? According to your faith, be it unto you. What do you expect to get out of life? Do you expect God to do something new in these days of time? Something new in the church? Do you expect God to do something new in your life? In these days of time, do you expect God to do something new in the nation in these days of time? Because according to your faith, be it unto you. I'm not talking about blind optimism. I'm not talking about trying hard to to hold on to something or believe something in spite of all of the odds. That's not what I'm saying. Faith is something that's based completely upon what God says in his word. Not what the world says, not what the situation says, but what the word of God says. For that situation. And Jesus says according to your faith. Whatever you're expecting for in life. That's what you will get out of life. Let me ask you. What are you expecting in life? Are things going to get better in your experience? Or are things going to get worse in your experience? Or tell me. Are things just going to be the same? Are you going to be prepared or happy? Just to let things remain the very same. You see, we've got to look at our faith. And if you act in faith, you will do something positive to ensure that you don't repeat the same mistakes that were in your experiences of the past. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, you needn't look it up. We're not going to read it. We know the story. The beggar who sat at the gate of the temple, it says he fastened his eyes upon Peter And upon John, listen to this, expecting to receive from them. Expecting to receive from them. He asked for something and he expected to get that from them. That's what the story tells us. He acted in faith, in other words. And praise God, you know the story. He was greatly rewarded. Silver and gold have I none But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And it says immediately, strength touched his ankle bones and his feet. And he rose and he jumped and he leaped, walking and praising and and, and worshiping God. Completely touched and healed by the power of God. Because he was expecting to receive something. You know, friends, we don't always have to know what it is that we need. But if we have faith in a mighty God to meet that need, whatever it might be. Praise God, we're open for him to do whatever he wants to do and give whatever he wants to give. But you know, often we ask for something, but we don't really expect to get it, do we now? Isn't that right? 
Sometimes we'll pray about stuff and we do it because we know that's the right thing to do. But is the faith really there? The expectancy really there in our hearts as it should be. We need faith. Sometimes we look back and we say, if I could only, you know, get back to that. If it was only like now as it was back then as it used to be. No, God says, don't consider the former things. You see, it's easier to reminisce than to look into the future with faith. With faith. Whenever you look back, you don't need faith to do that. And that's why Paul says, forgetting those things that are behind, I press forward. I press towards the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So we need faith. We need to reach out in faith. Let's reach forth. Let's embrace what God has up ahead for us as a church, for us as individuals. And let's, let's embrace it by faith. I'm almost finished, just two minutes. Another thing along with acting in faith is that we need to refocus. Refocus. If I want change, if I want new, I need to refocus my thinking. I need to change my mind, perhaps about a number of issues in my life and in my experience, as a man thinketh, so he is. And you see, the way you think determines the way you feel. And the way you feel determines the way you act. It's all linked together. And you see, often if we're depressed or if we're discouraged or if we're distressed, it can be because we're thinking depressed and thinking discouraging and thinking distressing thoughts. As he thinks, so he is. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We've got to stop thinking old patterns and we've got to get into God's way of thinking and God's way of doing things. Psalm 1, it says, Blessed or happy is the man that always meditates upon the word of God. He's like a tree. Isn't that right? He's planted by the river. And whatsoever he does, he just succeeds in life. Doesn't mean he won't have problems. Doesn't mean he won't have failures. But it means that overall he succeeds in life because he's meditating upon the word of God and he's living for the Lord. And so we have to then think about that as well. We've got to refocus our thinking. And then lastly, we have to trust. There must be trust. Trust God to help you to succeed. Depend upon the Lord. Depend upon him. Trust him. We've already proved that we can't do it on our own. It's not by might. You know the verse. Not by power. It's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now let me just throw out to you what I've given you. The first one is stop making excuses. The second one is take inventory of your life. The third one is act in faith. The fourth one is refocus your thinking. And the last one there was trust God. And I don't know where you've written those down or not, but if you did write them down and look at the first letter of every one of them, it says start. When do we do this, friends? We do it now. Behold, God's not saying, I'm going to do a new thing in 20 years' time. Some of us will not even be here, preacher included, probably, in 20 years' time. But in this verse, God says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. And I'm asking you today to start. Make the start now. Think about the future. Think about something new that we believe God can do. You see, friends, God can reach the lost. Amen. God can fill a church to overflowing. Amen. You know, we're living in a world where, in a country where laws are being changed and all kinds of things are happening. But God can, can't he? Bless his holy name. Of course he can. When's he going to do it? 20 years time? No, he says, now. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a highway, rivers in the desert and so on. I'm quoting it out of my head and I'm all mixed up in it. But you know what I'm trying to say there? It's now. It's not next week. It's not next month. It's not next year. But it's now. You see, God wants your life to be fresh today. God wants to do something fresh in your experience 
today. God wants to move in the life of his church today. And so we have got to be the people who take these things on board and prepare for the new and make the start now so that God can do it now and that God can bring blessing as he wants to bring his blessing. And so preparing for the new, that's where I leave it at today. Let me read the two verses to you once again. Remember you not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I'm asking you today, do you believe that? Do you believe that? I'm still asking you. You haven't answered me yet. Do you believe that? Of course you can. Friends, let's make sure that in our lives we're reaching out to him continually to enable him to do whatever it is that he wants to do for his great and his wonderful name.